and hours uh, to, uh, to make the fireworks booth like a real blessing uh, for our church, and so we're thankful for that. I also wanted to tell you that tomorrow at, um, at 12 o'clock, there's a, there's a whole process involved with the city of Las Vegas with the land that we're in the process of purchasing and the process of putting everything together. And tomorrow uh, is sort of one of the uh, dates that we have to have some paperwork turned in and kind of starts the process with the city. There's different plates that are all spinning at the same time. And one of those is getting what's called a special use permit for the two and a half acres so that we can have church. And so uh, just be praying for that specifically. Uh, we've got everything sort of lined up. All we have to do is upload it uh, by 12 o'clock tomorrow. And then two weeks after that, we have another meeting. And then a month after that, we have another meeting. And that's all a part of the process that we have to have um, uh, to kind of move forward with the purchase of the land. So if you could just be keeping that in prayer, we would sure appreciate that. And, uh, this morning, we're blessed to have uh, uh, Josh share with us in Many of you know that we have a teaching team, and we just believe that more is better, and we believe that, uh, that uh, there are folks sitting in our midst that are gifted and are able to share the word and, and communicate in a way that is, uh, is, is life-changing. And, and so we're, we're grateful for Josh's efforts and, and those who are part of our teaching team. So, uh, Josh, would you come up, Matt? I just want to pray for you before we begin. Would you all stand up if you could, please? <laughs> Amen. God, thank you for our, our brother and for, as Joseph has already prayed, for, the, for the, uh, the word that you have for us. Lord, we say amen to it already. Lord, we know that uh, your word has a, a, a specific design uh, that you want it to accomplish. And we pray, Lord, that we would not resist what you have to say to us this morning. We thank you, God, for this, your, your vessel this morning and for the word that you have laid upon his heart. We look forward to it, Lord, our spirit. Is, is hungry for it. We receive it now, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. amen. Oh, thank you. Good morning, everybody. I can, I can find those seats. Oh, almost lost my fuel. All right. Uh, it is, we are, we're finishing up our series called In Troubled Times, and, and how many of, would you, of you would agree that these are, these are indeed troubled times? Some some weird stuff going on. We're going to be examining uh, the peace of God in troubled times. We've got a lot to go through and not a whole lot of time, so I, I brought a little bit of motivation to get us through that. This morning is sponsored by Dutch Bros and uh, the Holy Spirit. So uh, we're going to be examining what God has to say in his word about peace in troubled times. We're going to start our work in Philippians 4 real quick. Just want to extra coat this thing in prayer before we move forward. Father, Father, we need you this morning to open up our eyes and our hearts to receive what you've got for us. May it, may it be your words that encourage us and equip us and move us forward today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so again, troubled times. And I was just kind of looking through what all has happened in 2020. Every month feels like a decade. Uh, there's every sane person has every reason to, to be a little rattled, to be a little, little upset even in these times, and we're all experiencing some form of stress, mental distress, we might be feeling anxieties, concerns, worries, even depression during the weirdness that's gone on. And if we just start listing out what's happened in 2020, it's amazing that we're still alive. Like we started off, we had the Australian fires, then, uh, then we lost Kobe, we impeached a president, we, we had a plague of locusts in Pakistan, all of this with the, the backdrop of COVID-19 everywhere and quarantines and isolations, masks, no masks, and all those weird swabs they put up your nose. Those, those are awful, by the way. If you can avoid those, do it. Just the worst. And then we had uh, Black Lives Matter protests, police brutality protests. We had CHOP or CHAZ up in Seattle. That's nuts. Pastor Richard come in in the morning. What's going on in Seattle? I don't have a clue, man. Those aren't my people anymore. I left. They, they kept that. But my favorite thing that has happened in all of the crazy chaos that is 2020 has been murder hornets. I just love the idea. It's like somebody's playing Revelation grab bag. They just shove their hand in the tribulation and start reaching around like, ooh, insects that come out of nowhere and just torment people and sting them. Yes, be free. I love the name murder hornets. Like that sounds like something like a 12-year-old boy would come up with. Like this is, who are you fighting today? I'm fighting murder hornets. So it's, it's insane out there, and we would, we would not be judged or looked at any differently for being a little bit unraveled by what's going on. But 
the, the Word of God talks about peace and the peace of God. And the, one of the fruits of the Spirit is, is peace. And Jesus promises to leave his peace. So why are so few of us experiencing it? Why are so few of us walking in that, that peace that was promised that's for us? It seems like the calm ones right now are the freaks. And we're meant to be those peace freaks. So we're going to look at uh, Philippians 4 and going into this, watching the Wednesday Night Live stuff, watching Pastor Richie and Miss Dawn. I've been working on this for, for some time, and I kept, I kept seeing there's going to be a convergence. We're going to hit Philippians 4 at the same time, and I knew it was coming, and it did. So we're going to hit it from different angles, hopefully, this morning, and hopefully the, uh, this, this challenges us in our walk. Uh, before we get into Philippians 4, we've got to summarize Philippians 3 kind of building up into it, because this is one letter, one thought. No matter how the translator try to trick you and put little subtitles and break it up, this is not a string of pearls. None of these things is an island unto itself. These are, these are uh, links in a chain, connecting one to the next to the next. So if we go back, Philippians 3, uh, Paul is talking to the church in Philippi, these, these new believers, this young house church, and, or house churches, and explaining to them, hey, there's these guys that are going around, they're called Judaizers. They really want you guys uh, to follow the law of Moses. They come up to you and they say, hey, Jesus is great. You need Jesus, but you need Jesus and. And they start adding stuff, like circumcision, following the Torah, keeping the Sabbath. And Paul's like, you don't need that stuff. You just need Jesus. It's just Jesus. And then he holds up his resume as, as Paul, the, the super Pharisee. He says, like, compared to these guys, I got it made. And then he burns his own resume and says it's, it's worth nothing. All of these things that were for my gain, they're meaningless, they're worthless. I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And that's Philippians 3.8, and I, I would argue that that's the central verse for the whole book and everything orbits around that. That's another time. So he goes from there into straining toward the goal, pressing on toward the upward call of Christ Jesus, letting go of what's behind, and I think he's mirroring the same sentiment of 3a. I've let go of these hindrances, these, these obstacles, the things that were for my benefit. I've, I've let them all go. They're all a loss. Nothing compares to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. So I've let go of these things. I strain on toward what's ahead. And then he gets into what looks like an aside. It's, it's, a, it's talking about a quarrel, a little dispute between these two contenders of the faith, Eudia and Syntyche. And, and as they're, they're fighting amongst each other, He's coming in and saying, hey, 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 we need unity. We need to be united in this, this proclamation of the gospel that we've talked about in all of chapter one. We need to be united in straining towards knowing Christ. We can't do this if we're hanging on to the baggage of disunity and dispute and, and little, little bickerings at each other. We've got to let that stuff go and press on towards the goal together. And then from there, he comes into our text this morning. We're in uh, Philippians 4, starting verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness, or, or sometimes better translated as gentleness, be known to everyone. Gentleness makes a lot more sense, especially coming out of the quarreling and the dispute part, and is also for homework, 2 Corinthians 10.1. Same word, gentleness. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Then we get into Paul's famous list of whatevers. Finally, brothers, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Or in the Greek, these things consider. It's going to be one of these little uh, couplets that Paul does in this section. Uh, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. Or these things, practice. He gives you two lists. These things consider, these things, practice. I like to think that he thinks in couplets because he grew up on Proverbs, and that's kind of how his mind is mapped out. That's just me. So these things consider, these things practice, and the God of peace will be with you. And then he moves into another section. So we've seen how the first bit kind of pushes the, the narrative, how it is straining towards the goal. We, we rejoice. We let our gentleness be known. We are not anxious. We are pushing on towards the goal of knowing Christ Jesus. And then he says, I have rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you've revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. They really wanted to support Paul's missionary ministry. They wanted to financially back him up, but they didn't have the means to be able to do that. And they finally been able to do that, and they sent it with this guy, Epaphroditus, he talks about uh, before chapter 3. And he's saying, hey, this is great. I appreciate it. You guys have blessed me and given me uh, money, but I want to let you know. And he moves on to, not that I'm speaking of being in need, 
For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. He was not in need. His needs were met, but it was an extra blessing. And they are partnering with him in the gospel. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. And in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So that's a lot. Usually when we talk about peace, the go-to verse is right there in 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything but by prayer and supplication. We go to that one. We love that one. In times of trouble, that is our verse. But there's more to it because it's part of a whole. It's chained in together with all these other arguments. And because it's chained together, and he had to be chained together, I, let's get into that real quick. This is a well-thought-out letter. This is not like a, a one-and-done, fired off with a couple of asides, a little PS in there. Paul doesn't do that. He doesn't have the, the time for that kind of stuff. He's got to think this thing out. He is sitting in jail, in prison, writing this thing, mulling over, arranging it in his mind. Like, this piece is going to go here, and then i got to back it up with this piece here and support this argument here so that they get it. And then he's got to pay a scribe, and they got to go through a couple of drafts, and the scribe's got to write out the final thing. And then he's got to teach the person who's going to carry this message to the church how to perform it. He's got to read it out loud in front of them. And Paul's like, you want to emphasize this right here. You want to, want to really drive it home here because he's going to go there and he's going to perform it. Then he's got to pay the scribe. He's got to pay to get the guy there to deliver the thing. So this, is, this cost Paul something to do. So it's well thought out, well constructed, and it's very intentional. If that's the case, then what Paul talks about in that last bit about contentment, it's got to tie in to talking about anxiety and peace. It's got to tie into that surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. Is Paul indicating here that our contentment plays a role in our ability to experience the peace of God. I would argue that that's exactly what Paul is saying. Paul is pointing toward our contentment, our level of peace, and our level of contentment being tied to one another. So are you content? Are you content like Paul is content in any and every circumstance? Like you leave this building and your bank account goes to zero, are you still content? You wake up in the morning and somebody has died and you've got a whole huge inheritance. Does it change you? Are you content? Do you value the surpassing worth of knowing Christ like Paul talks about? Like it's your everything? Or are you filled with worry, concern, agitation, mental distress? Is that what's driving you? So we're going to look a little bit further into this. We've we got to know that these kind of thoughts, they don't originate with Paul. Paul pulls most everything he's got from Old Testament thinking, rabbinical, pharisaical teaching, the stuff that he's grown up in and understood and how Jesus is a fulfillment of that stuff. So we got to know where does this come from and is this thought supported anywhere else in Scripture? So we're going to go look at what Jesus has to say in Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus is having one of his famous talks about worry. He does this a couple of times where he tells everybody, hey, do not worry. And when we have troubled times, we got worry in our lives, we don't go to this. We don't go to Jesus' words where he says, hey, don't worry, God, God's got you. We go to Paul and says, don't be anxious, rather by prayer and petition, where it's a little bit more practical, a little more hands-on, I know what I got to do. Okay, don't worry, just pray. When Luke chapter 12, Jesus says to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on, uh, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. And then he explains that God takes care of the stuff that he's created. He made the birds, he made the grass, and he takes care of those things. He, he feeds the birds, he, he clothes the grass and beautiful flowers, even though the grass is going to get thrown in a fire, as he says. And then he asks you, if you can't add an hour to your life by worrying, why are you worrying about any of the rest of this stuff? You can't make your life any longer. You can't do any of this stuff. God will meet your needs. Do not seek what you're to eat, what you're to drink, nor be worried. Uh, for the nations of the world seek this, or ethnos, the, the, basically the Gentiles. And it's like Jesus is implying, you don't want to be like the Gentiles, right? And all the Jewish people go, no. The nations of the world seek these things. Your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. And then he promises how, how the, the Father's good pleasures give you the kingdom. And he says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. How he concludes. This passage was kind of summarized and paraphrased for the sake of time. So Jesus here has told us, don't worry, God's got your needs. Seek first the kingdom of God. In Matthew, he'll add to that, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And let us know that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. But at the top end of this, 
the, at the, the start of all of this, he's got that, that magic word. It's therefore. And if you've learned anything at Living Grace, you have, you ask, have to ask that word the question, what's it there for? Therefore is one of those linking words that tells us, hey, something has happened before this. So this is coming as an effect, as, as, a, as a response to something else. So we back up a little bit to verse 13. Jesus is out and about doing his thing, being Jesus, ministering to the crowds. And somebody in the crowd like, just pipes up. Someone in the crowd said to him, Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. This is a reasonable request. I like, I like to think of this whole section as a reasonable request and an inconceivable response. It's a, it's a reasonable request. The guy's like, hey, Jesus, tell my brother to split the inheritance with me. And there's provisions in the Jewish law for that. There's, there's whole sections like, hey, look, when you die, your kids get your stuff. If the older one gets a little bit more, but everything else gets kind of split up evenly amongst the other ones. So it's, it's a reasonable request. If his brother's cheating him out of what is rightfully his, he has every right to ask for it. But Jesus said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. And then you, you can just feel the crowd get silent because covetousness is a sin. It's one of the big ones that's in the top ten. In the ten Commandments, number ten, thou shalt not covet. The guy's like, hey, I want what's rightfully mine. And Jesus goes, whoa, 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 whoa. You're dangerously close to sin. Everybody goes, whoa, what? I'm just asking for what's mine. How, how is any of this sinful? Jesus says, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told him a parable. And this is the parable of the American dream, for those of you following along. The land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. I got too much stuff and not enough space in my garage anymore. I need more garage. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods. Lay it up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. He's worked hard. He has earned this, right? He is, he is invested and, and, and built up what he has got, his little personal empire, and he, it's good. He's been a good steward. He's been wise and, and sound in his thinking, and he's built this up for himself. So he thinks, I'm set. I'm good. And then God steps in. But God said to him, fool. You know you're in trouble when God calls you a fool. This night your soul is required of you and the things you prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. That's an intense response to just wanting what's rightfully yours. And it, it, it seems inconceivable that that would be the response. The inheritance rightfully belonged to this guy. And then Jesus makes it an issue of covetousness. By the way, when was the last time you heard the word covetousness? Like, it's been a minute. I had, went, I had to go look up the definition of coveting because I couldn't remember anybody talking about it since I was in a kid's church. And, and the way they explained it is not what I'm seeing Jesus talk about here. So this is an issue of covetousness according to Jesus. He calls out that 10th commandment, that tenth commandment. It's the only commandment against the thought. And then he gives this parable of the American dream. And in this, we, we see that Jesus defines covetousness as materialism, as greed, selfishness, stinginess, wanting what's mine. The word covetousness in the Greek is a compound word. It, it literally breaks down into have more. So we might interpret Jesus' understanding of covetousness as thou shalt not keep up with the Joneses. I think the, uh, the best definition, because... Jesus connects then this materialism, this greed, and then he goes into do not worry. He takes it from being a material thing and makes it a mental thing, makes it a heart thing. So covetousness is not just materialism, not just greed for stuff. It is a heart thing. It is something inside of us. And Jesus draws that line for us. Coveting involves worry and concern and discontent. And where, where are my needs going to be met from? Where is my, my source John Piper defines covetousness as desiring something so much that you lose your contentment in God. 
Where do you find your contentment, your fulfillment? In, in what are we satisfied? How do you cope? What's your mechanism when things get stressful, when, when murder hornets abound? What do you go to? Matthew 6 reads pretty much the same in, in the do not be anxious narrative here. And that's your homework for the week. We don't have time for it this morning. Go, go and read Matthew 6 and, and see that. And he concludes the same the same way about not being anxious because God meets your needs. But pay close attention because how he leads into that section of do not worry is very similar. It's a, it's a different narrative because he's in the Sermon on the Mount. Instead of having a parable about the American dream, about a, a, a guy asking for his inheritance, Jesus teaches, store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves don't break in and steal, where your treasure is, your heart will be also, like he says here. And then he goes into a rabbinic idiom about uh, your, your generosity and, and, and light in your eye. If your eye is full of darkness, you're stingy and you hold what's yours and you don't give to those in need. And following that, he just like a punch in the mouth. He says, you cannot serve two masters. You will love one, hate the other, despise one, follow the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, do not worry. Jesus draws a line between money and, and needs getting met and content with anxiety. Madison Hetzler says, when our, our needs and wants are met, we worship the source. Trust is then garnered and we return to that source as desires continue to arise. Our lack of peace, even in troubled times, is an indication of our lack of contentment with God. Or as Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whether that's godly means or worldly, worldly means. When we, can, we can respond to this with a, with a heart that's following the old hymn that says, take the world, just give me Jesus. Or maybe we share in David's cry in Psalm 16, 5, the Lord is my, my chosen portion and my cup, he holds my lot. Back in Philippians 4, we see that, that Paul's reasoning it lines up with Jesus' reasoning. And we can only have the peace of God when our contentment is in God alone. We can only have the peace of God when our contentment is in God alone. And this, this is a gospel issue. As, as most of our issues are, it's a gospel issue. The contentment that we want, that we're talking about here, contentment with God can only come from a heart that's repented of sin repented of sin, like covetousness, like wanting to have more. And it's, it's a heart that's believed that Jesus is substitutionary, atone, substitutionary death on the cross atones for my sins, my wrongs toward God. Covetousness is one of the hallmark sins of our country. We, we have a whole mass media marketing like empire built around having more, and you need more. You don't have enough of this, you need more of that. We crave wealth and fame, health, attractiveness, approval, and security. We covet those, those things. Covetousness says, if I, if I just had this, I'd be satisfied. If I just had this thing here, I, I'd be okay. I'd be set. I'd be fulfilled even. That a little bit more. Spurgeon would tell you, if, if you are not content with what you have, you would not be satisfied if it were doubled. Security is a sneaky one. When it comes to covetousness, it's sneaky because it, it disguises itself. It, it looks like stewardship. Security looks like caring about others, your loved ones, your friends and family, and making sure that they're safe. When, when COVID hit, when the pandemic hit, we were worried about the people that we love catching this thing, getting sick, getting hospitalized, and dying. It's a sneaky one. But there's a line. You've got to watch. You've got to check, check yourself. If, if your desire and want to have more security for yourself or your loved ones crosses the line of losing your contentment with God, it's an issue. I'm not saying don't care about anybody. I'm, I'm saying watch your heart. Jesus teaches us, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. 
there's, a, there's an element where we've got to let some, some kindred go to an extent. So check your meter. Check your contentment meter. Check your heart and, and see where you're at. Evaluate yourself before God and see where your contentment lies. Watch for the indicators. Check your gauge. Covetousness is sneaky. It worms its way in. So we're going to get practical. And practically speaking, you have not been robbed of peace. Nobody, nobody snuck into your bedroom at night, reached under your pillow, took your peace, and ran out twirling their mustaches. Ah, I got you now. Nobody has robbed you of your peace. Rather, you have exchanged the peace of God for discontentment. There are three prescribed ways to regain the peace of God that we're talking about this morning. Three prescribed ways in the text that we've gone over today and they're to realign our contentment so that it rests solely in God. And the first is prayer. In Philippians 4, 6, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Instead of being anxious, we are to pray. And these words are fun because it's prosuke and deesis in the Greek, and both of those words get translated as prayer everywhere else. The one supplication right here, deesis, in chapter 1 is translated as prayer twice. So it can be a little confusing. It's like Paul saying, by prayer and prayer, with, so, with thanksgiving. But there are two different kinds when you look at the context throughout the New Testament. The first one, prosuke, is more of a praying to God about God, humbling ourselves, saying, you are God and I am not. The second one, deesis, is it's entreaty, it's supplication, it's requests, it's begging from a higher source. And this is modeled for us in the Lord's Prayer. The first half of it's about God. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the second half, it's about us and our needs. It's about asking God to meet those needs, give us our daily bread, forgive us our sins, lead us not into temptation. So that's the model for what Paul is talking about here. Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Why thanksgiving? Because we're content. Whether God says no or not yet, I am content. I don't need those things. If I needed them, God would give them to me. He'd provide for my needs. Whether or not I want them is another case. God meets my needs and I am thankful. And we have to be also careful that we remember this is prayer and supplication. This is, this is a humbling thing. This is an asking from a higher source. This is not decreeing or declaring. This is, this is not uh, speaking peace over this circumstance or this, this house or whatever. This is humbly asking God to please meet our need. Please bring the peace of God into this situation, into my life, into my home. We need to, second of all, recognize the nearness of the Lord. At the end of uh, verse 5, it says, The Lord is at hand. And this little snippet here, first of all, it's got a semicolon, and I, I just want to say, whoever translated that with a semicolon had an English minor, and just like, I need to put a semicolon somewhere. Punctuation didn't exist in the Bible until 500 AD. It was all written in all caps, no spaces. It's like some people write on Facebook and just, nah. So this could very easily just be a period. It's a pause. It's a stop. And the reason I emphasize that is because I think the rest of this little passage of verses 4 through 7 rotates around the Lord is at hand. We rejoice because the Lord is at hand. He is near. We let our gentleness be known to everyone. Why? The Lord's near. He's coming. I'm not anxious for anything. Why? Because the Lord is near and he's near in, in a couple of ways. One, he's a, the general at the gates. He is ready to come busting in and bring final reward and judgment. And he's holding back that more might be saved. He does not count slowness in the way that we count slowness. The, the, the divine concept of time is fundamentally different from mine. And he is near in that he is intimately close at hand. He knows the number of hairs on your head, no matter your hairstyle. You know, some of you look at me funny when I say that. He knows the number of hairs in your head. He knows the tears that you have cried. He writes them in his book. He keeps them in his jar. He's got your name inscribed on his palm. He is near. He is at hand. And that's why we rejoice. That's why we're not anxious. That's why we let our gentleness be known. 
So in regaining the peace of God, we, we pray and we pray and we recognize the nearness of the Lord and then we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What does that look like? What does it look like to seek first the kingdom of God? It, first and foremost, it looks like this. It looks like getting to know that God and his righteousness as he reveals himself in scripture. Getting into this and getting this into you. It, it's spending extended time in the word and getting to know it. Getting to know God. Seeking his kingdom and his righteousness as he reveals it. Studying is not a reading plan. It's, studying the Bible is not a reading plan. It's, it's pulling out. It, it's word by word, verse by verse, figuring out what God is saying because this is our daily bread. This is our life source. It's our lifeline. And discipleship is not an option. When we're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that comes with following the mandate to make disciples of all nations, like Jesus said. Discipleship's not an option. And you can only teach, that's what discipleship is, teaching, building up, raising up a believer in Christ, encouraging and equipping them. You can only teach them what you've learned yourself. So it goes back to you've got to get into this. You've got to know the word. It's got to be pouring out of you. You can only teach what you know. And discipleship isn't an option. It starts at the dinner table. It starts at home. Men, I expressly challenge the men. It's got to start at home. That's how we seek first the kingdom of God. That's how we, we consider these things. And look at that whatever list by, by Paul. We consider them by, by studying the things that are true and, and excellent and honorable as God reveals himself to be and reveals his word to be. And we practice these things. I want to start to close by going, taking us to Hebrews chapter 13. In Hebrews 13, verse 5, the author of Hebrews tells us, Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Moving forward, obedient to God's word, we must repent of our own covetousness. That's all of us. And a desire to, to have more, whether it's stuff, whether it's more security, more approval, it's, it's covetousness. And we must repent of our own covetousness. We must examine ourselves, call ourselves and our souls of the carpet and see where we lack and we must rid ourselves of our discontent with God. Let it go. It's a, it's, a, it's a hindrance. It's a weight on you as you're trying to run this race and press on towards the upward call of Christ, which is to know him. and Hold him as, the, as a surpassing worth, greater than everything else. Let it all go. If we are to have the peace of God in troubled times, it will only come in as much as we are content with God. If we are to shine as lights, as Paul tells us in Philippians, it will only happen in as much as we are content with God alone. May we live in agreement with the, the immortal words of Martin Luther in his hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Do you have peace this morning? Do you, do you have peace in these troubled times? That's, that's my hope for you to walk out of here with. Either you've got peace, you've, we, we're going we're gonna to pray, we're going to repent together in a, in a moment, and I, I hope you will move forward in peace from here. But if not, I hope you'll examine yourself and ask yourself why. If I don't have peace right now, why? Am I, am I discontent with God? Am I discontent with what I have and what he has put into my hands because he is faithful and good and has met my needs always? Do you have peace? And when the time comes when you don't have peace, because it's coming, more troubled times are coming, 
Covetousness is sneaky. When those times come, will you ask yourself, where is my peace gone? What have I exchanged it for? So when we walk out of here, knowing the peace of God, walking in the peace of God, seeking the peace of God in his word, in, in the surpassing worth of knowing him. Let's pray. Father, we are wretches, to, to borrow the word. We, uh, we're, we're, we're poor and miserable and humbled by your great goodness and kindness towards us. Father, we repent of wanting more, wanting to have more, or, or even calling good that which is evil. May we have a better understanding of your command for us in avoiding covetousness and seeking the kingdom of God, seeking your righteousness, treasuring the things that you treasure, despising the things you despise. May we walk in that same, that same light and peace and path. So we repent, Lord, of all sin, of all covetousness, of all of those things that would hinder us from knowing you more and more deeply. We love you, Father. As we walk out of here today, may we walk out in the peace of God and may it be such an infectious peace that others wonder why. They see us as, as, as freaks who have calm in the midst of, of chaos. Put people in our paths today and this week that we can share that peace with by sharing the gospel. We love you, Father. We trust you and, and we, we pursue you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.